So, uh, welcome everybody. Um, so my name is Jim from the Mary University of London. Um, my name is Dr. Tom Murphy, and I'm Deputy Director here at the Marlin Institute. Um, I will take a couple of time. We've got a couple of uh, announcements to make before I pass over to Dan and we'll kick off this fascinating event. So, the Marlin Institute brings together politicians, policy makers, academics, students, and the public. And our key uh, remit is to address challenges facing East London and the UK. We're a cross-party, non-partisan institute, so we have an event on the left and, Corbyn on, and Corbynism and Labour Party today, but we've done events with Jacob Rees-Mogg, Rory Stewart, Peter Mandelson, David Miliband, and the Chilean Minister for, e for the Economy. So we really are non-partisan. A few years ago, we did an event on Corbynomics, so in fact 2019, I think, so it'll be interesting to return to this subject today after the 2019 general election and the rights of Keir Starmer. Um, just quickly to say, there is no planned fire drill tonight, so if the fire alarm does go off, please do rapidly make your way, safely and rapidly, to your nearest fire exit here, here and there. Um, please do also follow us on social media, sign up to our mailing list. We've got a couple of interesting events coming up. On the 16th, we have a webinar about um, uh, on the 30th anniversary of Black Wednesday, and particularly how the opposition, how the Labour Party addressed Black Wednesday. Um, we've got David Ward, who um, was an advisor to John Smith, speaking of that. And uh, I think given what happened with Christ and Christ's budget, that's particularly relevant today. And um, in the 6th of December, we're doing a joint event with History and Policy on the awesome financial crisis in historical perspective. Right, without further ado, I'll hand over to Dan. Thank you. Um, so, welcome everybody. Uh, it's, as, as Colin said, it's three years Oh, approaching three years from uh, the, the 2019 general election uh, defeat, and it still feels, I think, for many of us, like a period um, very much after Corbyn. Um, I, I, like Colin, I'm not going to take up too much time. I'm just going to uh, briefly introduce our speakers. We will have five to ten minutes um, for them to speak. I think they're hopefully going to behave, and I won't have to ask them to, to won't have to cut them off. Um, and then we'll maybe have a few exchanges between speakers and then throw it open to the floor. I think we're quite keen to have uh, questions from the audience as many as possible. And then we're hoping to conclude the event uh, sharply at eight and there is, will be a drinks reception outside. So I just want to introduce you briefly to our speakers. We're going to begin, I'll, I'll read the names in the order in which they should be speaking. Um, we're going to begin with Dr. Madeline Davis. Dr. Madeline Davis is a reader in the School of Politics and International Relations at Queen Mary University of London, uh, working on the history of the left in Britain, and in particular the British New Left, and is also a member of the Socialist Register Editorial Collective. We'll then be hearing from James Schneider. James is uh, James was, was a co-founder of Momentum, was a former is a former head of strategic communications for Labour, communications director for the Progressive International, and his book. You can hold up a copy of it. Yes, uh, <laughs> our block, How We Win, was published by Verso in September. Andrew Fisher uh, was Labour's Director of Policy from 2015 to 2019 and writes for The I and Inside Croydon, uh, a, a publication with which I'm very familiar as a, as a fellow Croydonian. Um, we'll then move on to uh, Dr. Mary Robertson, a Senior Lecturer in Economics at the University of the West of England and Labour's Head of Economic Policy from 2016 to 2020. Finally, we'll conclude by hearing from uh, Nadia Whittam, MP, MP for Nottingham East since that 2019 uh, election, uh, and a member of the Socialist Campaign Group. Briefly, the PPS to Jonathan Ashworth after Starmer's election up until, uh, when was it, September 2020. Up until I was I was being careful. <laughs> um, okay, if there's no, nothing else I, I don't think I need to mention, so I'm going to hand over to Madeline um, to set us Yeah, and I'm sorry, in old school kind of academic fashion, since we've gone back to in-person teaching, I've rediscovered my preference for standing up um, <laughs> when I'm talking, <laughs> as opposed to two years of sort of staring at blank screens when we were doing lots of online teaching, so I hope that's okay. And I hope you can hear me, if not, just give me a wave. So, the left project that took shape around Jeremy Corbyn after he became Labour leader in 2015 was, I think, from the start, a battleground. 
For in some ways almost accidental, in media origins, Corbynism, as it was dubbed, became the focus of competing models and visions of left strategy, policy, and organization, as well, of course, of external attempts variously to define, diffuse, and defeat it. However, rather than kind of picking over the bones of Corbynism, I wanted to offer a few reflections that might help put it into some light context. And what I have to say, therefore, doesn't deal directly with this question, what should the left do now? But I hope it will set the context a little for some of the other contributions, perhaps especially James's, because I was just reading his book over the last couple of days as I was thinking about this event. Now, among the prompts that the panel were given for this event was the question, was the attempt by the left to remake Labour doomed from the start, as new left theorists have long argued. Now this question gestures towards a long-running academic and political debate about the limits and prospects of left Labourism, or Labour leftism, that has preoccupied those leftists, both within and outside the Labour Party, who have wanted explicitly to advance a transformative socialist agenda. This avowedly socialist left has been caught on the horns of the dilemma created by the Labour Party's preeminent position within a two-party system, which makes attempts to bypass or to supersede it seem both exceptionally difficult and on occasion politically irresponsible. They have thus repeatedly been drawn into attempts, or at least into thinking about the possibility for attempts, to transform the Labour Party from, in Miliband's words, a party of modest, modest social reform into a broadly mass and democratic party that would be capable of acting as a vehicle for a transformative agenda in relation to capitalism. So we can see then a long-running pattern whereby, despite subscribing to a generally pessimistic analysis of the prospects of this transformation, there are repeated attempts by such leftists to create the conditions for it. Now, key to this has been a strand of broadly Marxist analysis of the Labour Party's role and record, which originated among a group of writers and thinkers associated with the post-1956 New Left, which is my major um, research interest. This group of people included well-known figures, most notably Ralph Miliband and Tom Nairn, who generated and articulated critique and analysis of Labour and Labourism that becomes quite influential. I want just to highlight a couple of the elements, key elements of that analysis, and then very briefly indicate um, one or two ways in which it's been developed that might help us interpret and move on from Corbynism. The two points I really want to highlight are first, the argument that Labour's integration within the parliamentary system critically limits its ability to implement reforms when in office. This is the key insight that is advanced in Ralph Miliband's 1961 version of his book, Parliamentary Socialism. Although his advice to socialists at that particular point is nevertheless to get in and push. After the experience of Labour periods in government in the 60s and 70s, this argument has developed more forcefully to present the Labour Party as ever more firmly integrated into British capitalism and to stress the functional role it, like other social democratic parties and advanced Western capitalism, plays in managing and maintaining, uh, managing and containing rather, class conflict. Labour is therefore seen as having accepted the role of capitalism's B team, as James puts it in our block. Second point. This analysis emphasised the subordination of Labour's left wing both in Parliament and in the trades unions, within the structures of Labourism. The existence of a minority of socialists within the Labour Party is seen as functioning to legitimise the myth of the broad church and as providing an outlet for kind of periodically radical rhetoric and internal conflict, which is generally resolved in favour of the right. So this analysis then, this is the second key point, very much stresses the weaknesses and often intellectual <coughs> now it might also be worth just emphasizing that contrary to some commentary 
This strand of analysis that I'm talking about has not held the view that there was some kind of latent majority for socialism amongst the electorate, that Labour's moderation or the timidity of its leadership have continuously have either betrayed or frustrated. Rather, the hallmark of this new left analysis of the party has been the explicit claim that the main strategic task is the creation and mobilization of a new popular basis for a democratic <coughs> socialist agenda. That, according to Leo Panitch, was the task that the Labour Party, holding a basically <coughs> integrationist view of society, rather than as one defined by opposed class interests, that was the task that they had systematically declined to pursue. Instead, the Labour Party frequently worked to block, to diffuse, or to frustrate mobilisation on the basis of class by appealing instead to the national interest. And this juxtaposition of class and nation is um, a key theme in the work, particularly of someone like Tom Nair. Now, despite the pessimistic thrust of this analysis, its proponents, as I said, including Miliband himself, were repeatedly drawn back into attempts to transform the party. This, of course, had a lot to do with the absence of any alternative vehicle and the difficulties of trying to create one. But it also resulted from a developing and changing assessment of the significance of extra-parliamentary movements as sources of countervailing power. And this developing emphasis, I think, enabled this analysis to move a little bit beyond the, the binary, the sterility of this in or out of labour dichotomy. I recently wrote a piece for the journal Socialist Register, which traced the contribution of its longtime editor, Leo Panitch, to the development of this school of thought, and specifically the idea he and his collaborator, Colin Lees, developed of a Labour New Left. This term, Labour New Left, first appears in the 1997 critique of Blairite modernisation the end of parliamentary socialism. Against what they see as Blair's attempt to expunge and delegitimize old style <coughs> socialists, whose attempts spearheaded by Tony Benn to capture control of labor are blamed for labor's wilderness years of opposition, Panitch and Lee's cast, ben cast Benism instead as an alternative project of democratization and transformation and indeed one which is genuinely more modernizing than new labor. According to this kind of analysis, the significance of Ben is that he grasps the importance of diverse forms of extra-parliamentary activism, and he grasps the necessity to move beyond the traditional repertoire of an exhausted social democracy to defend its gains against a new right to challenge to the foundations of the post-war settlement. Benism's attempt, therefore, to re-mobilise Labour's social base and to democratise party structures, thus, as you can see, share elements of this new left critique of Labour in recognising or articulating that a new kind of party was needed if an even moderately radical agenda was to be sustained in government. Now, it's arguable that this, to some extent, is a post hoc reconstruction and certainly by the time the terminology of the Labour New Left gets into print, the forces of parliamentary paternalism, as they put it, have prevailed again, thus conforming to expectations and to this cycle. But you can see, I hope, the point and the force of this counter-narrative, both in 1997, when it's first advanced, and again at the moment that Corbyn gets elected. The almost accidental propulsion of such a candidate to the top of the party raises the question of whether this cycle of resistance and neutralization of left initiatives can finally be broken. So the question that is posed at this point is, can the Corbyn surge resume this task of turning the Labour Party into an effective agency of social and political remobilization? So elements of Corbynism that engage these people who um, come from this kind of broadly new left lineage, people like Panitch, Colin Lees, Hilary Wainwright and others, are pretty obvious, I think, once we grasp this history. Corbyn's own rootedness in extra-parliamentary activism, his own personal links back to Benism, efforts to create and to sustain a participatory popular base outside of purely electoral politics through momentum, through projects of political education and through community organizing. 
All of these themes speak very much to this kind of reworking of the Miliband type anal analysis to try to transcend this inside or outside of labor, this kind of impasse, if you like, in favor of some kind of alternative, some kind of dual power strategy around the building of, say, a movement party. And here the key questions are not then framed in terms of these tired binaries of so should, so should socialists be in or out of labor? <coughs> should we prioritize party activism or movement activism, but in ways that go beyond them? That to me, and this is my final point, has been the most interesting aspect of the dialogue between figures like Panitch, Wainwright and others, and younger activists in and around the Corbyn left. And in fact, James, just before I read your book, I'd read the conversation um, with Hilary Wainwright and you in Socialist Register, where you draw out the lessons from the partial and limited remobilization that Corbynism generates. So I'm really looking forward to hearing from you and from others um, on the panel about these possible ways forward and some alternatives. Thanks. Well, we've now been contextualized. So right. now we can hear. Sorry if I got it all wrong. <laughs> no, no, no. Thank you so much. Hello, everybody. Um, so I will focus uh, going forward, and um, I'll start with the bad news, which is that everything is fucked. Right? <laughs> uh, the you know, cost of living crisis, everyone, basically every London's standard of living is going to decline. The Climate change is completely running away, and uh, there's a global debt crisis brewing. So this is the very real bad current context. But now for good news. Good news is the ruling class has absolutely no idea what to do about it. They are completely clueless. There's not going to be a new cycle of accumulation, a new uh, cycle of growth, Liz Truss's bonkers dash for growth thing. None of that is going to, none of that's going to work. So things are bad. We don't have any power, but those in power don't know what to do about it. So, you know, where do we sit as the, or I, I should presume about the audience, where do we sit as the post Corbyn left and hopefully everybody here, where do we sit in that, uh, in that context, should we feel optimistic or, or sad? You know, what is the reality of the progressive resources that we have after five years of the Corbyn project? And I think there's quite a lot to work with. So if we start with the, the broadest base of things, which is popular opinion, where are people at currently in, uh, in what they think in society? And on a whole range of issues, public opinion, the basic underlying common sense, leans in a progressive and social democratic direction. If you poll people, uh, especially on issues of the economy, they're basically quite a long way to have by they I mean like a super majority, like two thirds to three quarters of the population. They're basically to the left of where we ended up in 2019. People really, really want to tax the rich and big business. They really want public ownership. They really want higher wages. They really want more spending on public services. And they also want uh, action on climate change. And that last one is coming through more in the poll. Then on our progressive side, our progressive forces, if you look at the, our organizations that uh, engage in society, so trade unions, social movements, campaign groups, they are also stronger than they were in 2015. So trade unions, uh, total trade union membership in the UK rose every year from 2016 to 2020 from a very low base, but that's the first time there's been four years of trade union membership numbers rising for over, over four decades. We've seen new social movements like Extinction Rebellion or Black Lives Matter surge onto the you know, international debate, inter, inter activism are, are able to shape and change things. Then we've also got the networks that developed through uh, the various mobilizations all around the country it, under corporatism. So there's a network of activists who, are, who have capacities who are able to do things. But we don't have a political vehicle. We all know that 
very well I, we all know that very painfully the Labour Party is not being let is not an expression of those progressive forces that are trying to grapple with the crisis in which we sit and take on the, the, the ruling class and nor is it trying to lead it. So you know, that's the context in which the main, I think the main strategic debate that you see on the left at the moment is this extremely old debate that Madeleine has been talking about this basically Labour yes or no. Is it doomed to go into Labour or is it doomed to try to do something else? And um, I argue, and I argue in the book that basically that's the wrong question. It's putting the cart, it's very speculative and it's putting the cart before the horse. It's putting the cart before the horse theoretically and it will drive us in wrong directions practically. So theoretically, uh, it's wrong because uh, Corbynism didn't fail, uh, as in fail to win elections and carry out uh, substantial reforms within the state. It didn't fail to do that because it was in charge of the Labour Party. We failed because we had insufficiently powerful so progressive social forces. We had uh, insufficient material within which to do battle. So we could ultimately be fractured and defeated as we were primarily on Brexit, but also other things. Um, and uh, so for me, the question is much more, how do we stimulate the, the movements and the social forces that could then have political expression. Then why it's really impractical is if you think that the main strategic debate is Labour, yes or no, then your response is your main political activity, political, uh, industrial, activist activity should be focused on the result of that. that. So either plough everything into Labour-left activity which, as we've seen over the last two years, basically means fighting, being defeated, hoping that the leadership does something, being miserable at each of the latest outrages and, broadly speaking, feeling quite impotent. Or it means trying to set up the latest tiny party with no real social base, no forms, no major organisation, social organisations behind it, and then spending endless hours rather than engaging in other forms of activity, which are clearly needed because, as I said at the top, everything's fucked, to, uh, to um, you know, instead argue about what type of rules should govern what types of meetings and all the kind of minutiae of setting up an organisation, which, you know, is, is really, you know, it's really tedious uh, work and very, very sapping, very energy sapping. So instead, I argue that what we should do is look at the various organisations and capacities that we have across the uh, across society and in politics that are progressive, that are on the left, and try to knit those together as much as possible. So that by that I mean the the, the left-led trade unions and the left-in trade unions, social movements, campaign groups, and the left of the Labour Party, both in its grassroots and in the socialist campaign group, people like Nadia. And also we have some good people in the Scottish Parliament and in the Welsh Senate and some in councils and, and met. And try to bring those together in a, in a hodgepodge kind of way, because there isn't one set thing that they can all do, but to work together in shared campaigns, in shared mobilisations, focused on the things that are facing people right now. And I think, you know, through that, we can firstly improve people's lives, improve our own lives now, but we will increase our organisation, we will increase the power of progressive social forces ready to uh, take advantage of whatever the next surge will be. And we know that, we don't know what form that will take. You know, of course, if anyone tells you that they knew that the anti-austerity feeling that was taking place in this country, that the fallout from the financial crisis was going to happen through the Labour Party in 2015 with Jeremy Corbyn at its head, you know, there's not a single person in the world who thought that was going to happen. And contingency really matters. You know, we wouldn't all be here if Eric Joyce hadn't got pissed and punched a Tory MP in a bar in, uh, in Parliament. So, but, you know, the thing that we can do is make ourselves more powerful, more organised and more coordinated 
where we can because you know we can see things are you know things are not good now and because they are the way they are they will not carry on being the way they are so you know for now what does that mean that we're doing we've got this winter coming which looks like it's going to be you know the most difficult for the the first covid winter excepting because there's different circumstances the most difficult winter that we you know people have faced for an extremely long time and that's why there's all sorts of resistance taking place, you know, uh, uh, everywhere. We're seeing, you know, strikes, and there are going to be more strikes, and they're going to be popular. They're all popular because, you know, ordinarily, if you have a big strike that gets a lot of media attention, if that's taking place in the context where most people's wages are sort of going up or sort of doing okay, sometimes that natural solidarity doesn't exist. But in the context where almost everyone's real-term pay and conditions are getting worse, it's incredibly easy for any strike to get pop well, incredibly easy in relative terms for any strike to be popular. So there are going to be loads of those and it's about bringing those together. Then there's, and these are the, these different types of resistance, these are the four main types of resistance that people have always used to face down power. So the first is strikes. The second is not pay. Is, is boycotting things, not paying. And we already have something like 2 million people that are not paying their energy bills. The don't pay campaign is starting going on strike, so that will be way more from the 1st of December. And there's a real job bringing that together uh, alongside the strikes. The third is occupations and direct action. We're seeing, because the scale of, the, of climate breakdown is, is so huge, and the more time you spend looking at it, the more frightening it is, the, I should, uh, yeah, I'm nearly done. The, um, the number of people that are ready to take uh, you know, more radical direct action, occupy things, cause a nuisance, get in the way of, uh, of, uh, of fossil fuels is much larger. And then the final one is uh, helping each other out. Everyone likes to help each other out, especially in difficult times. And we saw that in the pandemic with mutual aid groups. So I would argue that, or my argument is that the thing that the left can do that we can all do the post the post border left is to see that there are loads of things that are taking place. There are different forms of resistance, there are different forms of organizing. They're all taking place in the context of fundamental ruling class weakness. They don't know what to do, they don't know how to fix the situation. So we have uh, both an oppor opportunity and a duty, I think, to try to strengthen all of those struggles and knit them together. And through the pr process of doing that, some political opening or other opening could uh, could open up, and that would be the thing that we would then march forward through. Thanks a lot. Um, so, hi, I'm Andrew Fisher. Um, for those of you. Um, who don't know, I'm in the Labour Party, I'm currently the chair of my CLP, so we're not all getting smashed um, <laughs> day in and day out in the Labour Party. Um, although that probably is one of the few victories the left could say, I think it's a fairly minor one. But um, I want to sort of take on where James sort of ended a bit, really, which is why were we in a position to succeed in 2015? And it goes back to some of the things that you say. Um, one, and I'll, this is a bit of a glib point, but I'll try and justify it later, and I'm sure we'll debate it more. Um, why were we successful? Number one, because there was still a Labour left within the Labour Party, it hadn't all left. And that was, you know, I joined the Labour Party in 1996, that wasn't because I was a Blairite, um, it was because I was incredibly naive, really. Um, but it was because I hated the Tories through my life experience. I grew up in a single parent family in the 80s and early 90s. I have nothing but contempt, you know, those words of um, Nara and Bevan, uh, they're lower than vermin, you know. That kind of thing. That is how I felt about them. And actually, people quote that bit of an Iron Bevan's thing. But actually, the first part of it actually is a more interesting bit because he talks about his experiences in South Wales in the 1920s and 1930s and talks about the painful experiences the Tories inflicted on me and my community. And for me, that bit, when I read that full quote when I was probably about 19 or something many, many years ago, um, really resonated with me. And that's why I joined the Labour Party because it was just, yeah, that's. Um, it was an opposition to the Tories. So the fact that we stayed in during the Blair years means, uh, you know, somebody who's a bit older like me just wants to say sometimes, I won't say this, but sometimes I want to say, which is a passive aggressive way of saying it really, isn't it? Just suck it up, all right? It was worse under Blair than it is under Starmore, for fuck's sake, all right? Just, you know, 
it's called the struggle for a reason, all right? You know, um, bloody toughen up in the words of Tony Benn, who didn't swear very often, but did when giving that quote. But the second reason we succeeded, the more positive reason we succeeded, is because that Labour left did engage with the wider left. In fact, the two main figures of the, that success in 2015, Jeremy Corbyn and John McDonnell, were probably more engaged than any other two Labour MPs in the history of the Labour Party in wider social movements, whether that's the peace movement, whether it's trade unions. I mean, there's barely a picket line between sort of 20, well, 2001 to 2015 that John McDonnell wasn't on, um, and Jeremy Corbyn too, come to that. Um, Anti-racist movements, the anti-austerity movement that built up post-2010, as well as other campaigns that were perhaps smaller, more niche, like the tax justice campaign that then led to this sort of UK uncut direct action and all that sort of thing. There was an engagement right across the board with all of that. And the other reason why we succeeded was opportunism, and that's always a part of any success. Um, one part of that was to do with Eric Joyce punching somebody. Um, and I'll just give you a little more context about that for people who aren't quite so um, on the inside, is uh, he was the MP for Falkirk, and after that there was a selection battle, and ironically, the, uh, the left candidate for that selection battle in Falkirk was Carrie Murphy, who later became the um, uh, head of Jeremy's office. Um, but uh, in the wake of the supposed scandal, and I won't go into the allegations back and forth, mainly because I haven't got a good libel lawyer, um, <laughs> it ended up with the party reforming how it selects its leader. And the right has been a long campaign, actually by the, by the New Labour right, really, to open this up into primaries because they thought, actually, if we let the public in, it will marginalise all those mad lefties. And unfortunately, what they found is actually the public were way to the left of where New Labour was. Um, and the second reason, which is interlinked, is because the Labour kind of centre and right completely misread the mood of both the public and the membership in the wake of the 2015 election result. Their understanding was <coughs> that Ed Miliband was this mad left-winger who had dragged the party to the unelectable left, or oh, if only they knew what was going to come next, um, and had made them unelectable, and therefore we had to move back to sen you know, sensible Blairism. And actually every candidate, even Andy Byrne, who I think it's fair to say has shifted a bit to the left since, um, was in that in that kind of milieu in 2015, in that immediate aftermath, he launched his campaign in Deloitte and Tooth, or whatever it was called, the... Was it? I think it was Deloitte, actually, but wherever it was, it was some very right-wing place, as a symbolic, we agree on that, Alex, um, as a symbolic kind of move to the right. Um, that, and then obviously you had Yvette Cooper and, and Liz Kendall, and they misread that, so it opened up a huge gap where the Labour left could just fill this massive void where most of the membership was, which was actually, we weren't bold enough. It's something Ed Miliband himself has said since. Um, and so we won because of that, of those reasons. We can go into more depth on all of this. So I just want to look very briefly, because I don't want to talk for long, of, of where we are now. Um, as James said, I won't put it in quite the terms either, but we have been organisationally smashed since uh, Starmer took over. And I think Starmer embodies, you know, he's often compared to Blair, but actually I think he embodies two other people, which is Kinnock and John Smith. Kinnock in terms of purging the party, and John Smith really in terms of where we are politically, uh, in terms of policy at the moment. Um, <clears throat> and so on, on policy terms, Starmer I think is most comparable to John Smith, where he stands now. Um, and that is, and there's actually direct echoes of it, full rights for workers from day one, John Smith policy that was done by Blair. Public ownership of the railways, John Smith policy, dumped by Blair. Um, and there's a few others as well. And even on those current, current limited commitments that Keir Starmer has, that you could say are kind of social democratic, centre-left kind of core demands, um, he would be to the left of where Blair was, even in his first term, after which he then shifted massively to the right, you know, the bits of John Smithism that he hadn't managed to get rid of, like Shaw Start, the minimum wage, and so on. Um, so it's not a great endorsement of Starmer's policy programme, I'm just saying, objectively speaking, compared with previous Prime Ministers, he is uh, to the left of them. And I think it's interesting uh, where we stand, because he will come in in a time of massive crisis. He won't get the benevolent inheritance of New Labour. New Labour came in, obviously, with a massive majority politically, because the Tories had imploded, parallels with today to some extent, although it seems they may recover a bit, um, and a growing economy. Um, that have been growing since the, the crash of, of Black Wednesday. So, or shortly after, rather. But that's not going to be the case now. 
Um, and so what you see is actually even quite centrist Labour figures calling for more, slightly more radical things. So for instance, you have Sadiq Khan, you know, not a left winger by any means as mayor of London, calling for a rent freeze. That certainly wasn't the case. The um, campaign to have one in Scotland was led by Labour MSPs under Anna Sarwar. This is not the most radical person on the Labour left, or not even on the Labour left, frankly. Um, you know, you have Andy Byrne talking about public ownership of the buses. This is, you know, somebody who was a minister in the Blair Brown years. So again, you've seen this shift. This isn't because they've massively moved to the left. It's because of economic circumstances. And therefore, I do think there are opportunities for the left and our agenda to be put across. Not because we're going to take control of the Labour Party in the immediate future, I don't think. Um, unless Nadia is going to tell us something different in per from a parliamentary perspective. <laughs> it doesn't seem to me that way from the outside but because of the circumstances we're in. And actually, as James said, the right don't have answers to these questions, both the Labour right and the right more broadly. So in, in a sense, it is, you know, I think there are opportunities for us to win on some of these things. It's not going to be tough. It's not going to be easy. It's not going to be automatic. We have to organise. But um, there is no um, alternative. And the other thing I think we should ask ourselves is, you know, having said, stay in the Labour Party, and, you know, what should the left do now? I think we also have to think about what sort of Labour Party we want to be in. Being in the Labour Party, as, as um, both the two previous speakers have said, isn't a kind of counterpoint to trade union activism, direct action, all those things. You can do both, right? They're not exclusionary. In fact, they shouldn't be. Um, but the second type of thing is, I think we should ask, and this isn't asked enough, is what do we want the Labour Party to be? I think culturally we need to change the organisation from one that does sit about in dusty halls talking about the minutes of the last meeting and, and who wants to have which post that then does nothing over the next year. Um, we ought to be, you know, I ask myself regularly, why is it that the churches are setting up food banks? Why wasn't it the Labour Party that did that? We're organised in every community. Why weren't we doing that? Why aren't we giving that practical solidarity? If you look at the history of the Labour Party, the Labour movement, that sense of working class self-organisation was actually what founded the Labour Party, and yet we seem to have lost that. You know, the trade unions came out of that, the cooperative movement came out of that, friendly societies kind of came out of that. Um, you could argue building societies and other things did come out of that sense of working class self-organisation. What are we doing today to replicate that? And I think that's a better question to be asking about what the Labour Party should be doing rather than going off, you know, slashing our wrists at how bad Keir Starmer is or, you know, kind of talking kind of isolated to ourselves about policy in, in dusty rooms. Not that this is a dusty room, this is beautiful. Lovely <laughs> lecture. Yeah. And having a sort of venue asked stop at that point. <laughs> Okay, so uh, I approached the brief from the perspective of a uh, pissed off socialist who's really frustrated about what to do, uh, because, or frustrated about the current situation, basically because that's what I have. Uh, and the way I wanted to consider that is uh, by starting from critical self-reflection. We have gone from a position of, we being the left, the socialist left, have gone from a position of enormous strength to a position of incredible weakness in the space of just a few years. Uh, so why? What have been our biggest mistakes and what lessons can we learn from them? Uh, and I think we need to do that not for you know, the purpose of recriminations or nursing old wounds, um, but in order to learn the lessons so that we can shape our strategy today in light of them. Uh, and I would stress two key lessons. Uh, the first is that, the, and it's been touched on already, uh, that the Labour Party is not one big happy family. Um, you know, the Corbyn years made unequivocally clear that significant parts of the Labour Party are more opposed to socialism than they are to the Tories. Uh, and I think the Labour Party in its current form, which is a coalition of wildly <coughs> different political factions, is a historical accident. And I think any loyalty to it as an institution is misplaced. Uh, so the left should be, in my view, cold-blooded in its relationship with the Labour Party. Uh, it should be seen it is a potential vehicle through which to pursue, pursue socialism. Uh, and this purpose is, and we should be clear-sighted that this purpose, seeing the Labour Party uh, uh, or using the Labour Party to this purpose, is in direct conflict with those who see the Labour Party as a vehicle for other ends. Uh, and that includes uh, those who want the Labour Party to be capital's B team, but it also includes, perhaps less obviously, social democrats. Uh, and I borrow here from Andre Gores, who said, and I'm going to read his quote out, uh, 
or a quote out, the fact that social democratic leaders and socialist forces may find themselves in agreement on the necessity of certain reforms must never be allowed to confuse the basic difference between their respective goals and perspectives. So what is the difference? What is this basic difference? Socialists recognise that capitalism is ultimately unreformable. We may win concessions from capital for the working class, but they will be uh, isolated and temporary because they'll always be subordinated to the need to resolve capitalist crises and maintain the value form. Uh, socialists therefore fight for socialism, understood as far, the far-reaching transformation of social and economic relations as distinct from reforms to capitalism and social democracy. And I think one of the big mistakes the left is making at the moment, uh, and we see it every time the, the cult of the least bad rears its head, you know, let's... Uh, yeah, the left candidate has been blocked from being on the long list, but let's back the least bad of the ones who did make it, because at least they're less worse than the others, blah, 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 blah. Uh, yeah. Every time this happens, uh, and the left goes along with it, we're colluding in the subordination of socialist strategy to social democratic strategy. And I think it's leaving us hamstrung at the moment. So, first key lesson, our loyalty should be to socialism and not to the Labour Party. Second key lesson, uh, our biggest mistake was failing to reform party structures to cement the power of the left when we had the chance. And if I had to pinpoint this to one moment, it would be 2018 conference when CLP after CLP we were asked to withdraw their motions on party reform in anticipation of a party-led democracy review, which then turned out to be a huge betrayal. Uh, but we didn't learn the lesson then when Starmer did what we didn't do and launched a multi-fronted attack on the left we failed to respond with a coordinated fight back, and this despite the fact that at the time, the left had the numbers. Um, yeah, so Storm has done what we should have done, basically. And, but in saying that, I'm not proposing that we sink to the level of the Labour right. Uh, cementing the left's power means democratising power. It means taking power away from bureaucracy and back from deals and putting it in the hands of ordinary members. Uh, now, we're not in a position to do that now, uh, but I don't think that's a reason to not finally learn the lesson. So the second lesson, I would argue, is that for meaningful change, we need to prioritise building the left. Uh, so to go to the, the broader question of what should we be doing now as frustrated socialists, I don't think there's a single right answer. Right? Non-party political organising is extremely valuable. Um, I don't think it can be a substitute for parliamentary related activity. Uh, and that's for two reasons. One is uh, one of the effects of neoliberalism over the last 40 years of, re of reform have been to massively constrain uh, the ability of extra parliamentary or the, our capacity for extra parliamentary activity. U unions have had their hands tied. Um, we're seeing now legislation going through or have gone through parliament to limit the right to protest. And social movements cannot be separated from the parliamentary processes. So we need to engage with both. Um, I agree with Andrew that we need people do, prepared to do the hard work of maintaining and building the left within the Labour Party, uh, but I'm also now of the view that we need something happening. We need a parliamentary challenge to the Labour Party uh, from the left outside of the Labour Party. Um, basically because I think it would make a huge difference to see if we had a, even if a small group in within Parliament uh, providing an alternative left centre of gravity whether that's to kick the socialist campaign group into action uh, to, or because the possibility, possibility of a parliamentary split might allow actual pressure, might put actual pressure on Starmer in a way that uh, writing op-eds and so on doesn't, frankly. Uh, but we have to be aware that organising outside the Labour Party has its own challenges. You know, his, history teaches the past experience, shows us it needs to be geographically concentrated, single issue based, <coughs> and that personality is really important and these are all limitations. Um, or, yeah, challenging. <coughs> so, yeah, to sum up, I think uh, yeah, we need people. People will be drawn to different things. Uh, people will have different strengths and weaknesses and different forms of activity apart from organising within the Labour Party and uh, to electorally challenge the Labour Party. You can do all of those things and I think it's important that different comrades do all of those things. There's no single path guaranteed to to strength, back to strength or, or victory. Um, but I've said that um, a fighting left within the party 
is an important part of the strategy. Uh, I don't think we currently have that at the moment, so I'm going to end by saying a few words on what I think a fighting left within the party would look like or what that means. Uh, and the key issue for me is that we should stop trying to influence Starmer on policy and start trying to win back control of the party. Uh, and it's true that policy was central to, to building Corbyn's strength, um, but I don't think that lesson carries over to the new circumstances. Uh, in my opinion, trying to convince a right-wing leader of the Labour Party to adopt left policy, policies is at best futile uh, and at worst counterproductive. I think it's futile because uh, saying little on policy, not having answers to the problems of our day, is not a weakness for Starmer, given his strategy is to make Labour capitals BT. Right? We see his strategy being really effective at the moment, which is say nothing, try not to offend anybody, and then when the Tories start to shoot themselves in the foot, you start to go up in the polls, right? Um, so I don't think that's a weakness. And I also think it's futile because Achieving socialism will not be the cumulative result of a series of policy solutions to discrete problems. It will require radical transformation of prevailing political, economic and social arrangements. What we tried to begin to do in the 2017 and 2019 manifestos. A right-wing Labour leadership will never do this. At best, they'll cherry-pick a few of the left ideas. And again, these can only ever be temporary, especially in a period of sustained crises. Uh, and I think it's counterproductive for a number of reasons. Uh, it sows illusions and binds people into feeling part of a project, which I think can lead to a muzzling of criticisms which need to be aired. Uh, it inhibits the ability of socialists to differentiate ourselves and our strategy, while giving the right of the party left cover, creating the impression that the Labour Party is in fact a broad church. Uh, and it wastes finite resources and I think sets false expectations on what can be achieved, uh, and ends up patronising, demoralising and abandoning our base. Now, there's a big divide, I think, between those who think, oh, we need to be optimistic about how much Starmer's going to do for the left um, so we don't demoralise people. But for me, it's much more demoralising to have the, you know, the lived reality of being persecuted by the party that we're members of, uh, denied and false expectations set up in a leader who's made very clear that he doesn't want anything to do with the left. Um, so ultimately, we've suffered a series of profound defeats while focusing on policy and failing to defend our base. Uh, it's not fashionable or even comfortable to advocate faction fighting, but I think a cold hard look at our experience tells us that that's what's needed. Uh, and I think that's especially the case in the current crisis period. Now, this is my last point. Uh, another great socialist theorist of the state, Joaquin Hirsch, argued that in times of crisis, the conflicts between parties become more important than the conflict. So the conflicts within parties become more important than conflicts between parties. And that's because parties are forced to act against the interests of their members and constituencies as they attempt to deal with the crisis and stabilise the system. And I think this is incredibly relevant for today, where any Labour government is going to be pretty unpopular pretty damn quickly. You know, they're not going to have anything like the tailwinds that Blair had. And rather than merging ourselves, identifying ourselves with that government as socialists, we should be preparing to organise resistance to it. Nadia to finish. Thank you. Sorry about that. Sorry about that. Oh, I didn't stop my last time, but it's now been going for 25 hours. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Hi, everyone. I'm Nadia Whittam. I'm the Labour Member of Parliament for Nottingham East. I'm also the country's youngest MP since I was elected at the 2019 election. I think all of us remember that night on the 12th of December 2019. Obviously for me, that was the night that I became an MP and that my whole life would change overnight, but that's not my main memory of the 12th of December. I remember seeing the exit poll, being absolutely horrified and trying to grapple with the, the consequences that we knew would come from a hard right conservative government set to have an 80 seat majority. I was, like all of you, I'm sure, was devastated for my community, the community that I grew up in, terrified about what would happen to people. And then after that defeat came that slow and sad realisation that we were also going to lose the leadership of the Labour Party. 
Now, that hope and optimism that we felt during the Corbyn era, I think it would be it would be easy to kind of revel in nostalgia and to, to think about what could have been, but we can't afford to be stuck in the past because the climate crisis is here now. The effects are being felt in the here and now by communities, worst of all in the global south, but also in this country. The cost of living crisis is escalating, it's plunging millions of people deeper into poverty. We've got deepening geopolitical crises and we've got an increasingly emboldened Conservative Party that is threatening our basic democratic and human rights. And that is why we need a socialist movement that is future facing, has a future facing vision and strategy. And when we discuss the past, which is important, that shouldn't be to idealise it, but to identify the lessons that we need to learn and take forward. So I want to focus the rest of what I say on strategy. And firstly, I want to take the, the obvious question of the Labour Party. So I joined the Labour Party in 2013, not because I'm sure Ed Miliband would forgive me for saying, but not because I was inspired by the leadership, though I think Ed's doing fantastic work on the front bench now, but because I was part of the anti-austerity movement, I got involved in my local community when I was 16 because I was furious and devastated about what this government was doing to my community, about bedroom tax, about cuts to mental health services, about benefit cuts, and I was really annoyed that the Labour Party was failing to, to challenge that and I wanted to be part of the, the party that was making that happen, basically. So when we look at the history of the Labour left, it's, or the Labour Party in general, the left has invariably been a minority and often marginalised, often ridiculed by forces to our right. But we've still been in the party, we've been organising within to further our goals, to win the arguments, to, to push the party in our direction. And I, I understand how disempowering it is for Labour members when we see candidates being kept off long lists for spurious reasons, conference votes being ignored, members being suspended. And I don't blame people for feeling like they want to leave. But I, I would say this, when, when we look at recent history, that shows how quickly things can change. We wouldn't have had, well, we wouldn't be here today discussing post-Corbyn because there wouldn't have been a Corbyn if it wasn't for people staying in the party, if it wasn't for people like John McDonnell and Diane Abbott and Jeremy Corbyn himself rebelling against the whip when needed. But more importantly and broadly, I think, claiming space for socialists in our party, we wouldn't have the, le the left ecosystem that we have now with Navarra Media, a Tribune, um, the world transformed and momentum. All of those things have kept the left alive, not just within the parliamentary Labour Party, but in CLPs across the country. I think Jeremy, Jeremy Gilbert said recently, the Labour Party's not a football team that you can support or not support, it's the pitch. Now, I, I kind of tend to think that it can be both. I think you don't have to, you don't have to believe in the parliamentary road to socialism to stay in the Labour Party. It's enough just to believe that any change at all is possible through Parliament, which clearly it is. When we're looking forward to a Starmer-led Labour government, I think it's quite likely that that government is not going to abolish all the anti-trade union laws since Thatcher, as it should, partly because that hasn't actually been in any of our manifestos, even the 2017 and the 2019 manifesto, sadly. Um, but it would at least make it easier to ballot. It wouldn't be introducing new restrictions on the right to strike. I think probably not going to abolish capitalism, as it should, but it would at least improve workers' rights, fund public services better, reduce poverty, and take some action on the climate that would make our planet more livable. And then, of course, locally, well, on, on a local level, there's Preston, Wandsworth, Lewisham, Worthing, I'm sure there are other councils where 
left-wing councillors are at the forefront of bringing services in-house, building community wealth to alleviate the, the impact of austerity on people to resist the hostile environment. But we've obviously got to push the Labour Party further, and that happens both inside the party and from outside at once. I want to talk a little bit about the Corbyn coalition and what made it successful, because Corbyn managed to build this coalition between the old Labour left, the soft left that was getting annoyed about um, sort of certain policies being abandoned, and the more social movement left, which is the part of the left that I come from, really, whether that's people coming from the student movement or the anti-austerity movement like I did, anti-racist struggles and anti-imperialist struggles. But when, and I, I think this is understandable, when it felt like we were just moments from power, people got used to seeing the Labour Party as the main battleground. And what we saw was that while left ideas were more mainstream than they ever had been, or at least had been in decades, trade union membership was also plummeting, strike days were a record low, and the, the kind of energy that we saw from those street movements was also beginning to dissipate. So a lot of people threw their energy into the Labour Party, and it's not hard to see why so many people were demoralised, but I think it's really important to remember that passing conference motions and electing left-wingers to CLP positions, like though Andrew was fantastic, and lots of left-wingers in CLP positions are fantastic, it's not the only game in town. We can both stay in Labour and organise outside of it, in our communities, in our workplaces. And I, I just want to say briefly, in fact, this was meant to be the main part of what I was going to say, but I'm running out of time. Social movements are really important in for at least two reasons. So firstly, direct action defends people here and now from the effects of austerity, the effects of neoliberal capitalism and a hard right government that is attacking migrants and minorities, whether that's renters unions, anti grades networks, trade unions going on strike and winning pay rises and better terms and conditions for workers. And the Labour Party, the whole of the Labour Party, CLPs, councillors, MPs, can and should be actively involved in supporting these efforts. Um, secondly, social movements shift public opinion and that in turn ultimately impacts what the Labour Party does. So for example, I'm pretty confident that Keir Starmer would not have made these climate announcements like £28 billion pounds a year investment in um, a green transition which was not dissimilar from what John McDonnell promised. 100% clean energy by 2030, insulating 19 million homes. If it wasn't for the work of climate activists and the, the climate movement, whether that was school climate strikers, um, XR groups, Labour for a Green Deal. And as someone who was an activist long before I was an MP, I would say that I would much rather be doing activism under a Labour government than a Tory one, because I think to achieve meaningful change, more often than not, we both need a, a government that is not completely unsympathetic to progressive ideas and social movements who are prepared to hold it to account. And I think actually that would have been true even to some extent under a Corbyn government, but definitely is under a Starmer government. So we can't abandon the Labour Party, we can't leave the right wing um, alone, unchallenged. We've got to keep reclaiming our space, making arguments for transformative policies, getting left wing candidates elected. But we also can't neglect those extra parliamentary struggles, whether that's in our trade unions, in social movements. The question isn't either or, it's how can we effectively do both and link those two things together to respond to the pressing challenges of our time. Thanks.